All right, y'all, welcome back to the show. Uh, I'm Scott, and this is Anti-War Radio, and our next guest is the great Gareth Porter. He's a reporter for Interpress Service, that's IPSnews.net, and we run all his pieces at antiwar.com slash porter, including one, I think today or maybe it's yesterday's, no, today, uh, Pakistan moves to curb a more aggressive U.S. drone strikes spying. Welcome back to the show, Gareth. How's things? I'm fine, Scott. Thanks very much for having me again. Well, I'm very happy to have you here. So, uh, yeah, big news here uh, in Pakistan. Uh, how many people got kicked out and by who and what for? Well, uh, it, it appears that uh, what is happening right now is that uh, the Pakistanis are insisting that a, a large fraction, uh, as much as 40 percent, 25 to 40 percent, according to the New York Times, of the intelligence personnel, both military and uh, civilian, which the United States has infiltrated into Pakistan, are being uh, politely or impolitely asked to leave now. Um, and that this is, of course, uh, a result, as I tried to suggest in the title to this piece, uh, of a more extreme uh, U.S. policy uh, over the last uh, couple of years in Pakistan. That is to say, more extreme both in terms of uh, more and more intelligence people going in, and specifically unilateral intelligence people, meaning that the uh, Pakistani intelligence services don't know about these people, are not working with them. And secondly, uh, more extreme drone strikes, uh, which are killing more civilians, and uh, uh, doing much more political harm uh, to the Pakistani government uh, and its stability than the original drone strikes program, which the Pakistanis agreed to a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So, really, uh, Obama has escalated this thing. Uh, Petraeus has, I guess, uh, escalated this thing far beyond any agreement that they had with the Pakistanis? That's exactly right. I mean, the Obama administration has been the... Uh, the uh, one that has been responsible for this uh, escalation of violence and uh, escalation of espionage in Pakistan uh, with the effect of causing the Pakistani military leadership now uh, to finally say enough is enough. We have to do something to dial this back. We have to uh, really uh, get the Americans uh, to at least agree to reduce the levels of uh, U.S. military uh, uh, operations and espionage operations in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Well, so, you know, I don't know. For years, they've been willing to even invade Waziristan for us a few times, uh, wage a civil war in their own country for us. Uh, what is it that's going too far now? Well, I think that, uh, that there are two things going on here. One is, uh, I mean, the, the two different programs are causing two different sorts of problems for the uh, particularly for the Pakistani military leadership. With regard to the uh, intelligence operations of the United States, what the Pakistanis are upset with is the degree to which the United States is operating there without their knowledge. And, uh, I mean, this, this could be two uh, particular problems that the uh, Pakistanis in the, uh, have with the Americans, and it has to do with the uh, conflict of interest, which I know we've talked about uh, a number of times on your show, between the U.S. and Pakistan. The, the Pakistanis do not share the U.S. view that uh, the Afghan Taliban are the enemy uh, and that they are, uh, you know, the, that they should be subject to the kind of escalation of military uh, presence by the United States in Afghanistan and, and in Pakistan. And they also, of course, the Pakistanis clearly have their own uh, Islamic uh, a terrorist uh, network that operate against Indian interests. Uh, and both of, in both of those cases, it's clear the United States is sending in more and more intelligence agents to work in Pakistan on issues that are at odds with or, or uh, in interests that are at odds with those of Pakistan. So uh, very clearly, the, the Pakistani military uh, is, is not happy, is very unhappy with the uh, unilateral increase in, uh, in these uh, spies by the United States working in areas which are at odds with, with Pakistani interests. Mm -hmm. And then with regard to the drone strikes, uh, it's clear that the uh, Pakistani military was okay with drone strikes as long as it was limited to uh, al-Qaeda leaders and leaders of the uh, uh, Pakistani Taliban. 
But uh, clearly, the the uh, drone strikes program has evolved over the last three years or so into something that's very, very different, and which targets now uh, not only leaders but rank and file, and not just Al Qaeda and Pakistani Taliban, but also the Afghan Taliban and their Pakistani allies. And so it now gets into, uh, you know, it both uh, pisses off the Pakistani civilian population uh, across the entire country, and it works at odds with the Pakistani uh, military and, and intelligence services' interests. Yeah. All right. Well, so all the uh, the politics of the thing aside, what about the war on the ground? Maybe JSOC and the CIA have really been taking the fight to the enemy and getting some hard work done over there, man, and, and making real progress in the war, right? Well, uh, you know, obviously that's what they would like us to think, and that's uh, constantly a drumbeat of uh, propaganda put, being put out by uh, special forces, and particularly the CIA, leaking to the media. But, uh, you know, in fact, the consequences of the drone strikes program uh, are really very clearly catastrophic in terms of uh, the Pakistani government stability. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it has really uh, gotten to the point where I think the Pakistani military is quite alarmed about the degree to which Pakistanis are very angry about this. And it's both Pakistanis uh, outside the uh, Fatah region, the, the tribal region where the, the drone strikes are taking place, um, and within that region. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's both the general Pakistani population and it's the tribal people who are uh, getting more and more angry at the United States. And uh, after the most recent uh, case of uh, you know, huge numbers of uh, civilians being killed in a drone strike March 17th, uh, the, the tribal leaders across the, the North Waziristan uh, uh, region uh, vowed to take revenge against uh, Americans and said, you know, we never forgive our enemies. We will continue to uh, uh, take revenge uh, against the United States for 100 years. And this is the kind of attitude that uh, certainly cannot uh, make the, the Pakistani military leadership feel uh, uh, confidence about their relationship with the United States. I think they feel that it's become more and more dangerous. It's leaving them increasingly vulnerable politically. Yeah. Uh, I interviewed this guy, Shalkat Qadir, who was a former Brigadier General and wrote a couple things for Counterpunch. Yes. And, uh, you know, I brought up to him what uh, Margulies says, and which uh, you're referring to a bit there about um, why the uh, Pakistanis support the Afghan Taliban, and it's to to help limit the influence of the Indians there or something. And he just laughed that off. He kind of actually had uh, disparaging words for Margulies at that point and, uh, and said that, you know, the, the Pashtun people have no worry ever of being dominated by any combination of force that includes the Indians, and that's the least of their concern. And so I, I wonder if there's any other explanation maybe for why the Pakistani... Uh, intelligence, uh, military establishment support the insurgency against our their partners, the Americans in Afghanistan. At the same time, they support, to some degree anyway, our war against their Taliban in Pakistan. Well, I think you make a very important point. Uh, I I don't want to suggest that the Pakistani military and intelligence services are disinterested and objective in their uh, in their own assessment of their interests. Not by a long shot. I think that just as the United States used its Cold War with the Soviet Union uh, to, you know, take advantage of any relationship with clients and proxies to uh, expand its own military political power around the world. I think that the Pakistanis are undoubtedly seeing an opportunity here uh, with their, uh, their long-term historical relationship with the uh, Taliban in Afghanistan as a way of exerting uh, influence and, and power in Afghanistan, which, after all, is the, you know one of Pakistan's long-term uh, policies. It's, it's what they have tried to do uh, for for decades now, and uh, so so this is not a disinterested uh, policy by any means. Uh, but nevertheless, the the final consequence is still the same, which is that the, the Pakistanis uh, have very clearly and firmly defined their interests in ways that are at odds with those of the United States. Mm. 
And now, when it comes to uh, north and south of Waziristan and the federally administered tribal areas and whatever, that's supposedly where the last of the Arab-Afghan armies hiding out, I guess. And now, the problem there is simply the terrain, right? Nobody can really get there to do anything. They can't even fly a drone that high to get where they really want to go. Am I right? Uh, if you're talking about, uh, you're talking about in Pakistan, right? You're talking about tribal areas in Pakistan. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously the drones do, in fact, operate there. Um, and and the U.S. military, uh, you know, could could operate, um, you know, with their power and so forth in in the tribal areas. But uh, let's face it; I mean, this is getting into the most dangerous kind of uh, adventure that the United States could possibly engage in. And and even the military, the U.S. military, as hell bent as it is on expanding its war in whatever areas it can possibly do so. Uh, in, in ways that it feels would profit the, the military and its allies, I, I think that they are, and I've said this, uh, I think, many times, I think they are uh, realistic enough to understand that for the United States to try to go in uh, with conventional forces or with any large number of, uh, of, of special operations forces uh, really courts disaster, much less uh, trying to carry out uh, uh, an air war that would go beyond the drone strikes. I mean, I, I think that they're already in over their heads with regard to this drone strike program. Uh, so I'm not defending uh, the, the rationality of the U.S. military. But even uh, as crazy as I think they are, I don't think they're crazy enough uh, to be prepared to wage uh, a, a larger full-scale war in, inside Pakistan in the tribal, uh, the tribal areas of Pakistan. Uh, I think that's where they draw the line, and, and I think that... Um, the, the fundamental uh, operating principle is still for the U.S. military and for the CIA, and I'm including them in this generalization, what they really want to do is to continue their operations, continue their programs, and if possible, expand them wherever they can. Uh, it, it is not to achieve any particular overall objective, uh, but rather to continue uh, to have the power, the, the, uh, the prestige, as they see it at least, and the, uh, and, and the perquisites of the operations that they now have control of. Yeah, sure, just like any other bureaucrats. But I guess you're saying they know that there are limits, huh? I, I think that they do sense uh, where, where the costs and risks are so high that it would, it would be against their own interests. And I, I think that is indeed the case in this, in this area, in, in Pakistan generally and particularly in the, in the tribal areas. Mm. All right, well, we've seen 10 years of trying, almost 10 years of trying to prop up the Karzai government and make it the government of Afghanistan. And have they made any progress at all in the decade in question here? Well, I think we have uh, succeeded in turning a, uh, a, a relatively uh, heavily corrupt, corrupted uh, state into a completely corrupted state. Uh, one that is so far uh, down that road that there's no possibility of dialing it back or of, of shifting the nature of that uh, regime. Uh, I, I think we have so thoroughly corrupted it by pouring uh, the, the billions of dollars that we have into uh, Afghanistan that we have uh, uh, created a monster that uh, is, is going to help defeat uh, it is helping defeat the U.S. effort uh, in Afghanistan because, uh, after all, I mean, the, the fundamental appeal of the uh, Taliban to uh, the, the vast majority of the Pashtun population is precisely the uh, rampant uh, injustice, the, uh, the abuse of power by the, uh, uh, the, the elite of, of the uh, Afghan government under Karzai and under U.S. and NATO protection. And that obviously is something that simply cannot be changed because we have uh, essentially created a structure uh, that, uh, you know, like many other things, simply cannot be uh, reversed. Well, you know, Malalai Joya, the uh, Afghan activist, was on the show last week, and her message, uh, paraphrase, was basically, just leave. We don't want the warlords, and we don't want the Taliban. My people, the people of Afghanistan, we can work this out without you. Do you think, Gareth, uh, and, you know, I know that you don't think we should stay, 
but uh, I wonder whether you think that the average Joe, uh, average Sally in Afghanistan has a chance against the warlords and the Taliban that will be leaving behind to resume their civil war even more than before. Um, well, I think there are two points that I would make. One is that uh, I, I do agree that the consequence of, of a precipitous U.S. withdrawal uh, you know, would be, uh, at least in the short term, a continuation of a civil war. Um, uh, I, I, I'm not sure how long that would last. I, I think it is likely that the, uh, the other uh, political military forces would be forced to abandon the south of Afghanistan to the Taliban pretty quickly, uh, and that the Taliban would still have pockets of uh, influence and military presence in the north as well, in, in those areas particularly where they have Pashtun uh, populations. And, and there are important uh, centers of, of, popu uh, of Pashtun population in the north of Afghanistan. On the other hand, uh, as I think many others have pointed out, it is not likely that the, uh, the, the Taliban would be in a position to completely uh, defeat their um, non-Pashtun opponents in Afghanistan. I think it would be uh, in, their, in, their, in their interest to reach a, a political solution with uh, the, the, the other ethnic groups in Afghanistan. I think that's the most likely outcome. And, and the second point that I would make is that even if uh, the, the process takes uh, years and years uh, to reach a final uh, solution between the uh, the Pashtun, uh, the Taliban represented Pashtun, uh, and the other ethnic groups in, in Afghanistan, they're going to do so faster and more effectively and with longer term uh, of beneficial results than the United States and NATO trying to intervene and to uh, uh, try to bring about the, the kind of uh, settlements that that serves those foreign interests. I mean, I think that's a fundamental principle that we all need to uh, get on board with as the basis for uh, U.S. policy. And so, in the end, uh, regardless of the, the uh, cost and uh, the time that it takes for the present conflict uh, to, to reach a, a peace settlement after the Americans withdraw, uh, that is infinitely preferable to trying to expect that the Americans and Europeans are going to do a better job. Right. Well, I guess, you know, one of the arguments we could certainly anticipate would be that, well, you're just turning the country over to the Indians, the Russians, the Iranians, the Pakistanis, and let them have their proxy wars there instead fighting over that. The, the poor people of Afghanistan will be leaving them behind like we did after 1989. Well, I think the answer to that is yes and no. I mean, undoubtedly, the Pakistanis, the Indians, uh, Russians, and so forth, uh, Iranians, would be arming those forces with whom they have ties. I have no doubt about that. They would be sending arms and, and financial support. Uh, but that would be a much improved, uh, a much uh, improved situation compared with having uh, 150,000 foreign troops with helicopters and gunships and uh, high-powered uh, uh, bombs and, and all the rest, uh, I, I think that uh, the Afghans would stand a better chance of, of bringing about a settlement uh, sooner under those circumstances. Yeah, well, you know, the whole thing is, is what a big joke this entire hypothetical conversation is. I mean, uh, unless the dollar breaks overnight, something like that, this war is going to be going on for how long? Decades? Well, I mean, I think that there's a new there's a new factor here, and that is the uh, the budget deficit and debt issue in American politics. Uh, I think we're seeing, uh, as of of today, the beginning of a new stage in these politics, in which it's going to be impossible to keep the military, the bloated military budget, off the table. And by that, I mean not just. Uh, you know, the, the, the sort of token cuts that have been discussed in the past, I think that it's inevitable that they're going to be forced uh, to really make some more substantive cuts, which, as has been now that President Obama has stated publicly, that he is going to carry out a review of the American role in the world and U.S. mission, U.S. military roles and missions in the world. 
And I think that may be token a new awareness that this, the, the status quo in terms of this kind of military spending simply cannot continue, and that the pressure on the kind of uh, empire that the United States is trying to maintain, um, uh, an empire of military bases and programs, simply is, is going to have to be uh, dialed back. And so uh, I, I do think that uh, that is going to have uh, ultimately a, a, a clear uh, impact on U.S. policy in Afghanistan. It's going mm -hmm. to have a very strong impact on U.S. policy in Afghanistan. Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, sounds great, but, uh, you know, yesterday on TV, the hairdos were talking about maybe David Petraeus should run for president in 2012. I like to think he'd have to at least wait till 2016 to do it, but uh, maybe not. They, they say he's cutting and running, fleeing in cowardly terror from Afghanistan here pretty soon, right? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think Petraeus is dead meat politically um, be, because of the storyline that uh, will, in fact, be repeated many times over the next few months, that he was too tired uh, and uh, uh, was unable to maintain uh, the, the strength and energy needed to manage the war in Afghanistan. Yeah, he's still uh, ten you know, times the man was, Obama is when it comes to that kind of strutting on TV, you know, with all those yeah, shiny I, ribbons on his uniform and all that. Yeah, I, I just think the myth of Petraeus is is in in free fall. I, I think that we're going to see the consequences of that uh, in the coming months. That I, I, I just doubt very much if his a star is is politically going to be on the rise in the Republican Party. But I mean, I think it would be fine if he decided to run. I think he'd be eminently, uh, you know, unsuccessful, and mm -hmm. I think it would be probably a, a positive thing for the anti-empire movement if he did do so. Wow, I don't know, man. I mean, you look at the rest of the field that he has to deal with, Newt Gingrich and them, you know, Mitt well, Romney. I'm that even if he gets the nomination, I think that would probably be a good, a good thing. Uh, uh, it, would, it would sharpen the debate, and I think in the end, the consequences would be to speed up the end of the empire. Yeah. Oh, or just uh, help, you know, gear up uh, Obama supporters, give him more of a blank check to continue the wars with or without Petraeus actually running them for him. Well, I mean, what, I guess what I'm saying is that if there's one hope for ginning up a citizen's movement, which, as you well know, is my mantra here, that's the only way that things are going to change, that it would be to have Petraeus as a candidate. I mean, that would obviously energize the base of our anti-empire movement, and I think that's, that's what I'm really counting on uh, yeah. as, as a way of, of, of speeding up the process. I'm not guaranteeing anything uh, at all, far from it. I'm just saying that if there's going to be a chance for change, then I think that would that would speed it up. Yeah. Well, I hope you're right, because I think if that guy ever does become the president, he'll be inaugurated in that uniform. He won't wear a rumpled old suit like Ike Eisenhower did. Well, I think that he would be a terrible president, and um, and I would uh, I, I would expect the worst. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely opposed uh, to to any possibility of his becoming new president, but uh, at the same time, I think you know if if he were to be nominated, which I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that's very likely. But if he were to be nominated, I think that we would have a better chance of doing what we need to do anyway, which is to uh, really organize a uh, a strong citizens movement across this country uh, to go door to door and seek uh, support for a, uh, a, a pulling of the plug on the permanent war state, take away their funding and uh, permanently change the, uh, the distribution of power in the United States. Yeah, close down the Pentagon and put the Secretary of War's office in a little office building down the street from the Capitol like the old days. Or as close as, as we can come to that, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, well, it's been a long while since those old days. Um, well, you know, uh, I don't know. I appreciate your hopefulness. I think uh, it's pretty clear that, um, you know, the American people, that maybe, I don't know how clear it is, seems to me at least, that uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan are just too far away, that the only way really to get the American people to change their mind is to understand how much it's costing them, how much worse off this society is here because of just the price of all that mass murder overseas, you know? I think there are two. I think there are two issues that we can and, and need to exploit, and one is exactly the one that you've uh, just alluded to: that the cost 
is uh, is so uh, incredibly high in terms of this particular economy, the United States economy at this stage of its history, that that need that has to be uh, the first priority in any campaign by a citizens movement. But I would say, in addition to that, we've got to do a better job of raising uh, the issue of the degree to which the uh, the U.S. Uh, permanent war states policies and operations in the Islamic world expose the American people unnecessarily to the highest risk of physical danger uh, that that the American uh, that American population has ever been exposed to. Uh, and, and I think that that is a message that simply has not been hammered uh, sufficiently. And, and I would say very few Americans really uh, have focused their attention on that. And I think that if uh, if a citizens' movement were to hammer away at that message and document it as it can, uh, frequently that it would make a huge difference and uh, that we would win. Yeah. Well, I sure hope you're right about that. Now, uh, I don't have much hope that Ron Paul will be elected or anything like that, but I'm very hopeful for his campaign uh, in terms of being the best speaking tour on behalf of peace and liberty since, well, the last time. And that's something that no matter what they ask him, especially, you know, when it concerns uh, budget matters, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, he always goes back to the empire and policing the world and that kind of thing. And in a way, I think that really gives license to conservatives to go ahead and agree with him when before they thought they would have to be like Michael Moore to, to have that kind of position or whatever. And he kind of says, no, it's OK. You could be a conservative Texas Republican Christian and be completely against all this imperialism. And I I really have a lot of hope that the conversation will continue to change, that he'll have a lot to do with changing the conversation as far as that goes, you know? Well, I agree with that. And arguably, uh, you know, this kind of citizens movement that I'm talking about cannot succeed without the, the supporters of Ron Paul being integrally involved in it. It has to be a, a left-right, anti-empire, uh, anti-permanent war state uh, coalition. Uh, which in, in which the supporters of Ron Paul are are very very important, mm -hmm. and and so I hope that your listeners will, at the appropriate moment when we have a proposal to give Ron Paul uh, for a an alternative uh, military posture and strategy and alternative military and intelligence budget, uh, that that your listeners will will seek uh, ask Ron Paul to support this co-sponsor it. Uh, put it in the hopper as a uh, as as a doable proposition, a doable objective that the citizens' movement can then be mobilized around. That's the only way that I can possibly see that we can succeed in turning this uh, situation around. Mm -hmm. Well, now, and uh, when's this coming out, and who's publishing it? Well, what I'm talking about is something that I'm working on. Um, I, I want to bring together a group of specialists on the military budget as well as some people, specialist criti critics of U.S. terrorism policy, uh, uh, policy towards the, uh, uh, towards the threat of terrorism, uh, to, to put together a very short, succinct alternative policy and budget, which would be the basis uh, for piece of legislation. And, mm. and that's when I will go to Ron Paul and Chris Inich or somebody uh, on the other side of the aisle to ask them to put this in, uh, to, to co-sponsor this legislation, come up with a, a name like the End the Permanent War State Act of 2012, and, and begin to organize around it. Because uh, in my view, and I, I think you probably agree with this, the, the biggest single cause of disempowerment and, and the flaccid nature of, of the movement against these wars has been the feeling that nothing can be done. There's no way that we can change anything. This is the only way we can do it. We have to have millions of people sign up to pledge that they will never support a candidate who doesn't, uh, who's not committed to this, whether it's in con for Congress or presidency, and, and to put pressure on the Congress uh, to, uh, to, to pass this legislation. That's when we can get change. Yeah. Well, I'm not so sure democracy works, but I sure think it's worth a try. It's the most important issue facing our society. As James Madison said, you know, war is the germ of every other bit of corruption and, and uh, overturning of what we hold to be valuable in this society. And uh, it's the number one first thing we've got to organize uh, to oppose. So 
Uh, as always, Gareth, I appreciate your journalism. I appreciate your opinions and your time on this show. Thanks very much, Scott. Thanks for being here. Everybody, that's the great Gareth Porter. IPSnews.net, antiwar.com slash porter. We'll be right back. <laughs> 